Hello, welcome. Um, right now we have a presentation from Dr. Madawa Glover. Madawa, are you, um, would you like to give a brief intro into what you're presenting on today? Yes, and I shall also share my screen if I get that, get that right. Okay. Um, I have to choose a window. Sorry about window. this. I should have had it set up. No, it's okay. It's a little bit tricky. Is that working? Um, let me see. We are. Yes. Okay. Yay. All right. Um, are you ready? And I will go and hide until you need me. Okay. I uh, can't quite see the chat as usual. But anyway, thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you so much to all of you again for having me join you, letting me join you to share information. And um, I'll ask you, Nancy, if you could keep an eye on any questions and feel free to pop in. Uh, I don't have as many slides as yesterday, so I hope that um, you can pop in, say we've got a question okay. here and that that would be really useful for me. Would you do that? Okay. I will Thank do that you. for you, but you will not see me. So three, okay. two, one, here you go. Okay, thank you. So, um, good evening. It's uh, 10 o'clock at night in New Zealand here, and it's wonderful to be joining you again uh, to on the scope. An incredibly important forum that you've set up to enable consumers, particularly and advocates for consumers, to have a voice while the Framework Convention Conference of the Parties number nine goes on online, but it completely excluding you, uh, consumers, advocates for consumers, and many, many others. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to particularly focus on the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, Article 5.3, and how it's being used to silence, exile, exclude, um, defame, and destroy and cancel people, anyone with a different opinion to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control Secretariat, to prohibitionists within tobacco control who have um, quite a dominant voice in there, but they're not the only ones. So who am I? I am, I have my Centre of Research Excellence uh, focusing on Indigenous sovereignty and in smoking, so smoking among reducing the harms of smoking among all Indigenous peoples in the world and I'm very concerned about minority groups, marginalised groups, people who are left out uh, and so just to recap, um, I have been working in community health since 1988 and in public health since 1993. Actually in 1993 I began working as a policy analyst for a government crown agency on tobacco control policy. So I want to talk a little bit about that to give you an insight into uh, particularly the, the, I guess the origins of uh, some of the article 5.3 and uh, I've attended many, many conferences and worked after being a policy analyst. I went to work in national intervention of a Māori tobacco control program and built capacity among the Māori community, the Indigenous people of New Zealand in that topic. And I basically, you know, been a a public servant for a long time, then went back to university to do my PhD. And from then on, I've been doing research. And uh, so I'm a scientist, nearly 30 years of, of science. Now, I just will also recap my disclosures. I have never received funding from any tobacco or vaping product company. Uh, 
I did many, many years ago some consultancy for uh, pharmaceutical companies when they were looking at bringing smoking cessation medications into New Zealand. The work of my centre, everything I do here, is funded with a grant from, a, from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. I put in a research-initiated uh, proposal for funding into a contested round, same as I have always done, um, and that they were my ideas. Nobody, you know, no tobacco company person or anyone associated with the foundation told me what to put in, and all of my research projects are that way. So I'm not doing commissioned work. It's independent, independently thought of based on my many, many years research. So I'm extending what I have been doing. However, as you know, the foundation uh, was established with a, a large uh, charitable donation and a pledge of, that that would continue for 12 years. Uh, it was set up by Philip Morris International in coordination with uh, Derek Yuck, who was the immediate past president of the foundation. And under the bylaws in America, um, the law, laws in that state and this, the pledge agreement, it's all transparent, it's all online and you can read it. Uh, the foundation was set up to be an independent 501c3 charitable organization. Under the laws there, they have to uh, declare, like put in documents to inland, to inland Revenue or the tax department, all the money they've received and who they've paid it out to. Under that law, if the foundation was in reality working for the benefit of the tobacco company, of Philip Morris International, particularly the donors. You can't be a charitable organization under the 501c3 uh, law and be working for your donors. Then otherwise you're just like an advertising agency or you're, you're on contract. So under US law that it was established under, it is independent of Philip Morris. Uh, otherwise they would be shut down uh, under that law. I uh, looked at all of that, of course, and believe that that is the truth. Now, under the terms of my grant agreement directly with the Foundation uh, for a Smoke-Free World, the work I do is editorially independent. They do not decide what projects I'm going to put into them. They do not have any say over how I conduct my research, the results that I choose to report on. They don't see my draft publications, etc. And this is the, the standard practice for researchers and academics and universities and other researchers who call themselves independent. In my experience, actually getting funding from the government uh, crown agency the Health Research Council or uh, some of the other agencies I've had funding from, for example, uh, Cancer Society of New Zealand who give out grants to researchers. You know, once I had had funding from them and I had one of uh, the directors from there, one of the Cancer Society people, write to me and tell me off for an opinion that I expressed. And it was said in the letter like, we have funded you. Um, you know, I don't get any of that sort of thing uh, from the foundation. I am free to do my work as a scientist, an independent scientist. Anything I say uh, here, the contents of this talk, um, the selection and presentations of facts and the opinions I express are my sole responsibility and under no circumstances shall be regarded as representing the positions of the foundations for a smoke-free world. Interestingly today, and I think that it may be indicative of the success of your event you are running now this week in parallel to the Conference of the Parties of the Framework Convention Tobacco Control, who are also having their online function all this week. I was um, invited to be interviewed um, by a journalist in New Zealand and 
uh, of course, what she wants to ask me about is my funding. So um, good on you. You know, you've passed the screen test. And uh, I think that you know, our competitors, if we can, well, they're certainly my competitors. I'm not saying they are yours if you're a consumer. But as a researcher um, across many sectors, actually, research and academics, even surviving in academia, it's a, it's a cutthroat sector. It's highly competitive, uh, backstabbing and, and going onto funding committees and sabotaging grants from competing centers of research who work in the same topic as you. It's, it's just rife. Uh, so I do see the people that want to shut me down many of them are competitors in those funding rounds where I have been very successful for over 15 years. Um, I was not employed by a university with a secure salary. I was a soft funded researcher. What that means is if I didn't secure funding in contested funding rounds open to all researchers, I didn't have a job. That's how successful I was at securing funding. So it's, it, you know, it benefits uh, my competitors for that research funding for them to cancel me. Uh, and they've been at that for some time, way, way before the foundation was probably even thought of. So what I want to focus on in this talk is just explaining a little bit about Article 5.3. Uh, and it's one of the articles of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. That's a United Nations treaty, the first treaty to, to attend to a, a health issue as such. And the parties, the countries that sign up to that commit to implementing a range of tobacco control measures, including Article 5.3. Those uh, measures are actually expressed in quite broad terms and the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, it makes it very, very specific that they recognise the sovereignty of the countries to tailor uh, the specifics of how they will implement these measures such as um, a law to reduce exposure to secondhand smoke, tax tobacco. And Article 5.3, um, this is about um, preventing the tobacco industry from having any role or influence in the, the conception of, design and implementation and monitoring of tobacco control policies. So why we did that, and uh, I, so that's a quote there, in setting and implementing their public health policies with respect to tobacco control, parties shall act to protect these policies from commercial and other vested interests, and this is what is of particular interest to you as consumers and advocates for consumers, uh, because this is where they're applying this article to you to rationalize and justify the exclusion of the voice of consumers. So, so protect these policies from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry in accordance with national law. So it really depends on a country's national law, how far that, that can go. So just going back to when I was a policy analyst in tobacco control and uh, so you you run submissions, you seek, uh, you know, citizens in, in a democracy have the chance to have a say about proposed laws. And so there would be a draft document would go out for consultation and people would write in. Did consumers write in? People who smoked back then, of course, in uh, 1993. 93, 94, yes, they did. And um, I was told that, well, they're probably paid by the tobacco, a tobacco company, uh, that the tobacco company formed front groups of consumers um, 
so I was led to believe that that they yeah they probably did smoke but they weren't the same as you know just somebody on the street who's asked for their opinion they were being paid and there are groups in the world that do receive funding from tobacco companies to support their activities there are non-government groups who do lobbying and anyone can donate money and among those anyone's are tobacco companies so it is true that there are some groups but what happened was that any consumer that wrote in their opinion was basically ignored now that is not what you would expect in a democracy that's uh, as a policy analyst working for a government agency now if a the members of parliament hold an inquiry and that's completely sort of open to the public to come along and tell their story to members of parliament elected representatives that's slightly different and it's really up to those uh, members of parliament to assess the stories that are told to them and then they they can decide what they want to do and where they go of course government officials have a lot of influence they're going to go in and they're going to say to those members of parliament as well oh no no you know so many of these people are probably paid to be there paid to tell their story by tobacco companies there were things like I remember postcards uh, a whole lot of postcards would come in so you'd go into the petrol station that sells tobacco and there on the counter would be these postcards opposing a proposed law for instance you could tick I propose this whatever law it is or this increase in tax and then citizens could sign that and send it in well we were pretty much told that was a tobacco company campaign and to ignore it so this goes back what's happening to you as vaping advocates goes back 30 years it's been the practice in tobacco control and among uh, policy analysts working in public health it's it's that it's that's the way it's been and it is still that now what's happening of course now is that the framework convention on tobacco control is is lumping any any manufacturer even if they're independent completely independent of the to, of a tobacco company um, a manufacturer of vaping products um, retailers vape shop uh, chains and owners and people that work in vape shops and and of course then you get to consumers and it's the same belief anyone who who speaks up for vaping must be paid by a tobacco company and they're stretching the definition of tobacco company to include well that's anyone who is also a vaping product company so this article is very important to understanding um, how you can have a voice uh, if you will ever get to have a voice and and what to do about it um, <laughs> yes it's it's um, so this is what the conference of the party recommendations were you get the general intent the tobacco companies for for even decades before the framework convention on tobacco control did all sorts of things uh, you know there's evidence that they bribed members of parliament in different states in the US for example and those states where where political parties received donations from tobacco companies and or members of parliament received donations and support for their political campaigns where that happened in states where it happened versus states where it didn't happen or was not allowed you would see a difference in what policies went forward so the framework convention on tobacco control is supposed to be based on scientific evidence and it's supposed to keep up with that scientific evidence as well and there was evidence that the tobacco industry had 
done all kinds of scurrilous things. And that's what I was told. That's what all of us in tobacco control believed. Um, they're, they were evil um, and they must, that's why there's such a strong focus on trying to destroy the tobacco industry. And um, we won't get into well, who is the tobacco industry, you know, I mean, obviously you've got shareholders, you've got governments, China Tobacco, Japan Tobacco, uh, some of the largest tobacco companies in the world are owned by, by countries, uh, the governments of those countries. So conference of the, uh, the um, framework convention, the parties that signed up are supposed to reject any kind of partnership at all, any any commercial, any kind of partnership um, and non-binding or non-enforceable agreements with the industry. So, you know, do not engage, do not, do not entertain their offers or, or um, you know, like they might come and say, well, we'll, we'll pull this product or, or we'll do this or we'll do that if you do this. Um, they, the country's also supposed to require information by the industry to be transparent and accurate. Now, this is very important for the vaping um, product industry, the independent vaping industry. In New Zealand, the New Zealand regulations, the vaping regulations requires, uh, well, nearly all of the uh, specialist vape stores, uh, manufacturers and distributors, importers and distributors have to register and they have to submit yearly uh, a lot of documentation on their activity, even, uh, and all the products, they have to list all of the ingredients. So basically removing any kind of right to intellectual property or to protect your intellectual property. Uh, so Article 5.3 is behind the a country's move to require um, a lot of information and that's that's about this being transparent, transparent and accurate. Marawa. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question and it's actually a really relevant question. Because of these recommendations, how is it that countries such as China or India or Thailand are allowed to be in the FCTC when the government has interests in the tobacco industry? I think that uh, the main thing is to get countries to sign up and then of course they're told that this is law, this is legally binding and and then pressure can be exerted upon those countries to fall in line. Um, if you don't, if they, if they're not allowed to join then how is the FCTC secretariat and the other parties going to exert that pressure? I mean, you, you will see, I and mean, it's interesting that um, the US never signed it, but they're doing exactly what is in there now. Uh, a lot later, Russia, the Russian Federation wasn't a signatory. They are now, and they are now implementing uh, what they can. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in the FCTC to allow governments to do what they can when they can, and that's enabled those countries that own outright or have large shares in their tobacco, or their own tobacco companies, to be party to this. Of obviously, that creates a lot of uh, discomfort for uh, delegates from other countries that basically prohibitionist delegates uh, and yeah the other the other parties so there, there's a lot of pressure being put all the time through the world health regional offices and the fctc secretariat okay yeah because we have another comment and it's 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 chugga and she's saying um isn't tobacco control including certain philanthropists effectively doing the very same thing that quote unquote big tobacco has done in the past yeah, that's right. It's it's really interesting to see, because that was another thing. It was like we needed as policy analysts, as people in tobacco control, you know, you need to know your enemy. You need to understand your enemy. And yeah, we I guess we learned a lot from 
what the industry was doing and it was kind of fight like with like um, so we learned a lot from them and now i can see that tobacco control uses many of the very same tactics that the tobacco industry used and especially around this article 5.3 does that answer the question? I think that answers the question. We've got a yeppers, so that answered the question. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so the point I was on was uh, another one, what another obligation of, of signatories is to denormalize or regulate and prevent uh, activities described as socially responsible so the tobacco companies, they will put out a corporate social responsibility report. And in that, like in New Zealand, I remember one, it was like a glossy sort of booklet. And the industry would list there all of the community activities or groups that they had supported. So in New Zealand, for example, we have what what's called the Life Education Trust. And that was, if you could picture this, a bus that traveled around and visited schools, primary schools, so schools with children aged five through to uh, maybe 12. Um, the bus would come around and they had a large, a giraffe with a very, well, of course, giraffes have very long necks, but it had the giraffe as the kind of mascot logo. And they would come around and do education about smoking and it's smoking harmed and and I remember when I was uh, exposed to them coming to uh, I think the college them I must have been in high school so they even came to high schools and I remember this jar that had a pink lung in it and a jar with a black lung in it and you know that kind of really freaked me out I went home to my father I actually remember I nearly got the bash. I took the cigarette out of his mouth and threw it away and, and said, hey, smoking kills. Uh, actually, but at that time, I I was mixing with kids who were already experimenting with uh, cigarettes and, you know, one had been handed to me. So I was kind of maybe trying to deflect attention from the fact that I'd actually begun to initiate smoking. That was some um, I was only 13, so quite common, that sort of thing. But anyway, um, Life Education Trust visited schools and did education, anti-smoking, smoking kills education, and they were funded by a tobacco company. So eventually the Ministry of Health talked with the Life Education Trust enacting this, this particular clause, talked with them, that they cannot continue to receive money from tobacco companies. And I think probably the ministry replaced that advertising. Another one that happened here was that tobacco companies used to fund the B&H, fashion awards, uh, motorsports, all sorts of things like that. So our Smoke Free Environments Act 1990, which was before the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and our act actually became kind of a benchmark uh, and a starting point for the framework convention on tobacco control itself. So our 1990 act included in it the formation of the Health Sponsorship Council and that the role of that Crown Agency was to replace tobacco sponsorship of the B&H Fashion Awards and many other sporting events uh, that the industry had been funding. So. New Zealand kind of set the uh, set the bar there, and for a while, the government replaced that funding and supported those events and organisations to find alternative sources of funds. So that's part of denormalising. Also, part of that was raising awareness of you know big bad tobacco companies putting out these these reports and claiming. Uh, social responsibility. So the other one there is raising awareness about the practice of front groups. And this is being used against um, independent vaping advocate groups all around the world. So uh, independent vaping advocacy groups are 
and I can, I can tell you, I'm sure that the people in tobacco control honestly believe that those groups are funded by a tobacco company. You can't tell, you couldn't tell us, you know, even myself, you, no one could have told me that, no, no, they're not. We were so um, brainwashed to believe that. And I'm sure that those people in there now still believe it. They believe it um, and they're acting from that belief. So raising awareness about the practice of front groups. Um, all interactions with the industry should be public. So I remember that Brazil, what they did, the Brazil, the government set up a website. Any contact at all with a tobacco company was recorded there. If a tobacco company representative rang a member of parliament or rang a government official or they wrote a letter or there was a meeting, it was all recorded there. So that's part of that, uh, making it all public. And of course, government officials, members of parliament, anyone working anywhere in government was to never, never have, um, they had to make sure and protect themselves against accusations of or actual conflicts of interest. So for example, if we were at a tobacco conference, Society for Research on Nicotine Tobacco, for instance, I went to many of those conferences and uh, it used to be until just this year that tobacco company researchers could present their work at those conferences. So, you know, we had to guard against like, if they offered you a cup of coffee, you can't even take a cup of coffee. You know, don't don't be seen even stand standing talking to them because someone might get a photo of you and then they could use it and they can say, oh yes, well we talked with Dr. Glover at the such and such, you know, or or um so it was it was a very suspicious um culture and and I think it's still very much like that. Um so anyway, the industry is not allowed to be a partner in any initiative at all linked to public health. And um, yep, so I've covered that one. Any other questions on that? No, I think oh. we're good. Okay, I'll go on. Um, so as you, as you pointed out, there is a conflict of interest in that some of the party states also own tobacco companies. So the, this is what is recommended with regard to, um, to them is that the government sh should not manage any tobacco industry and they should not invest in any tobacco industry. So it is fully expected that those parties will um, disinvest and uh, withdraw. So. Korean um, K, I always think of G and T, that it's T and G, K, T and G, the Korean um, tobacco company used to be owned by the government there. That's like the, it's one of the biggest tobacco, uh, among them, let's say the top 10 in terms of the size. Um, and I think the government still gives them even though they're now out of it, they still give them awards. They they are so huge for the economy there. And that's in South Korea. Um, so now I don't want to talk too much about how this has been used against me, but I, th I think we can pick this letter apart a little bit. So let me just um, go through this with you and please let me know, Nancy, if we are running out of time. So in, August 2019, we had had a change of government and what happens when governments change is that government officials, it's kind of the, if it's a new party, so we, we had a national party, which is kind of on the, you know, for business, um, the center, center right, and then center left got in. Well, whenever there's a change from left to right, the new government always sweep clean, you know, um, and get rid of government officials who worked for the other side um, and who are known to to bat, you know, for the other side, so to speak. <laughs> Bad analogy. Um, so we had a change of government and Dr. Ashley Bloomfield at the bottom there, uh, he, is, he became Director General of Health. Now, Ottawa. Yes. Excuse me. 
Can you make that bigger because no one can see it? Okay. Um, I can. Okay. Try to. At the bottom, yeah. Yeah. Bottom right. That isn't working, is it? What if I full screen for a moment? Go ahead. Will it? Full screen for a moment. Yeah, That's then fine. you won't see me, but and I won't be able to see the chat. But you'll keep me in touch with yes. with what's happening. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to bring that letter up. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're a go. Now, so um, this letter went out from our current Director General of Health. I didn't do that. Sorry. It's okay. And the Director General of Health is the highest um, health government official uh, in the country. Now, uh, this letter went to District Health Board, Chief Executives and public health organizations. So basically that covers all government funded health services in the country. And the letter reminds them of the New Zealand's international obligation regarding tobacco control under the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control to avoid potential influence from tobacco companies. The government goes is committed to reaching smoke-free 2025. So anyway, in the first uh, paragraph here, it invokes Article 5.3. This is why he's writing the letter. It's an international treaty and, you know, to, what does he say? Address the substantial global harm related to tobacco use. Tobacco use being a very general, anything to do with tobacco there. And it, you know, you could say, well, it's about global harm, uh, but the, We'll get to how that's been changed. And they want to bring the, the everyone working in health in New Zealand, who's funded by the government, their attention to Article 5.3, which requires parties to avoid undue influence from the tobacco industry. Then it goes on that Phil, about Philip Morris, major manufacturing distributor. They're not the only one, of course, but they're picked out here. Um, oh, they had heard that apparently Philip Morris had approached some district health boards and other organizations to discuss its its new smokeless tobacco product, which would be the ICOS, um, that it is actively marketing in New Zealand. Uh, and under the FCTC, the minute the uh, and this is in the guidelines, you can it says you must advise people not to engage with representatives from tobacco companies or the industry. So representatives from Philip Morris International or representatives from the tobacco industry um, and the health sector does not share the same goals or aspirations of this industry. Then it goes on to specifically um, move into blacklisting anyone working in health funded by the government having anything at all to do with me. So they talk about the Philip Morris funding, the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Uh, you could argue whether that's technically correct, giving a donation. Um, and that the foundation in turn provides funding to a range of, sorry, groups including my centre, led by me. So they um, explain that Philip Morris remains a key stakeholder in tobacco products. I discourage you from engaging with the foundation, the center or any of its representatives. So me or any of my staff or anybody working for me on contract for me uh, on tobacco control mat matters, including smoking cessation, which is my area of expertise. Uh, um, while the centre remains in receipt of funding from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Then he acknowledges that I'm a long-standing contributor to tobacco control and in particular a strong advocate for achieving better outcomes for Māori, the Indigenous people. However, there's a range of alternative sources of information and advice on smoking cessation. Uh, not at my level there isn't. And the possible use of vaping products to support cessation, including for Māori. 
So you can go elsewhere, but you must not um, have anything to do with me or my centre. Um, and then they just ask people to let them know. Again, that is in the guidelines about monitoring uh, the activity. And that was written by um, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield. And he was actually, he did a stint at the um, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control at World Health Organization. While he was there, he actually worked on the facilitation of the working group that wrote the guideline on Article 5.3. So we have someone way back in uh, the turn of 2000 uh, and around 2010. So, you know, you could say that he's pretty much an expert in that guideline because he worked on the writing of it and now he's the Director General of Health and gets to implement it in a very extreme way, um, probably the most extreme form of, of the way in which this has been used. So I'm just going to go back out uh, so I can reconnect with you guys. Um, any questions on that or comments? Actually, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's just basically saying it sounds like childish games, which is what it is. Um, I wonder, and I mean, this is a New Zealand context, so this may not relate to everybody, but it is kind of important. When the new regulations were coming in and they just wholesale banned snus, we're going to talk more about this tomorrow, but I want to kind of cover it now. Being that he was there, and being now we've got people like Professor Beaglehall saying, you know, I was wrong. Do you think that there's any possibility that Dr. Bloomfield may see the light and come around with regards to like snus? Absolutely not. No, okay. to, to do this. I mean, I worked with Ashley Bloomfield at the Public Health Commission in 1993. Um, okay. You know, he knows me and yeah, but the lies that have been put out there, you know, for anyone to think that I'm working to further the interests of the tobacco industry, the problem here is that they are including any independent vaping product companies. They basically lump that in. Well, that's tobacco industry as well. And as Joanna Cohen um, in the States, now she was a co-author on a paper with three others, I think. And they kind of wrote this, oh, what if paper? Where, where can we get more funding for research for tobacco control? Hmm, here's four scenarios. Um, the government could make the tobacco companies pay, pay money over, like um, the master settlement agreements in the US. Um, and so they had they had these four scenarios. Scenarios. One of them was that the tobacco companies or industry could donate funds to the establishment of an independent foundation that would then give out the money to tobacco control researchers. And that is where the idea came from. Mm -hmm. And you know you can see if you watch her present presenting on this that you know it's eating her up inside that she was a co-author on a paper that actually explored the idea or put the idea as a scenario and it's happened. You know, what they didn't like was that the money didn't get given to them mm. and that uh, that the money, that this independent foundation got established and the focus is harm reduction. Well, that's what tobacco control always was about. It even says it in this letter. It's about reducing that substantial global harm related to tobacco use. Well, most of that is caused by smoking, over 90%. At, you know, 30 years ago, there was no vaping product, there was mm. snus, but we were all led to believe that, you know, it was mainly smoking that killed, that was the cause of smoking related disease. Most of the diseases and the early deaths over 90% is probably caused by smoking. And there's a small amount, obviously it's a lot proportionally more for India, um, that is caused by chewing tobacco. But even that, chewing tobacco, you know, refers to any product that had a little bit of tobacco in it. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm 
actually won't come around and especially now. So the other thing that um, I think is important for me to point out when you think about the law. Now, when this occurred, this was before the vaping regulations in New Zealand. And I, I um, began to take legal action against this. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And Ashley Bloomfield is running the response to COVID-19. So in New Zealand, he is like a hero. Uh, and when you take legal action, it comes down to whose story, um, who tells the better story. It comes down to the judge and how the judge interprets the law. Now, you, you raise the question of SNUS. And if we can just go back, there was a court case. Um, I think, I can't remember if the Ministry of Health took, took Philip Morris to court for importing and selling uh, the heat sticks, the, the, the yeah, tobacco remember containing that. heat sticks, right? Yeah. Now, the judge dismissed the case and there were some very, very important points that the judge made. And one of them was, why would you ban a product that will reduce the harm that smoking does? That was the whole intent of the Smoke Free Environments Act that was written and passed in 1990. Why you can't, he, the judge said they were basically acting against their own law the Ministry of Health was taking yeah. action against their own law. So what did they do? They changed the law. They removed the purpose of the law being to reduce harm. Mm -hmm. And they changed the purpose of the law to be about denormalizing vaping. So the new vaping regulations in New Zealand, I urge everyone to have a look at the purpose. And it says this overwrites the purpose of the Smoke Free Environments Act 1990. That original act was about reducing deaths and disease from smoking and from exposure to smoking. You the know other thing interesting? Yeah. Sorry. No, that's um, right. Regarding SNUS. Um, I had a meeting. Um, it was myself, it was Dane, and there was a whole bunch of us um, that went to the Ministry of Health and we had a meeting. This was under national. So the previous government to our current government. And we sat around this table and SNUS did come up. And they were saying, okay, they, they were very anti-heated tobacco, but they seemed to be okay with SNUS. And then all of a sudden we had a change of government and that was like, that's it, done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, so the the Butler versus Ministry, uh, Ministry of Health versus Philip Morris case with Judge Butler, you see, um, now when I started in, in tobacco control, working with Murray Logerson, mm -hmm. he told me that SNUS was illegal. He always believed it was banned. Uh, there was a previous kind of Toxic Substances Act. And so even Murray thought that Swedish SNUS was illegal to import and sell here. You can import it for your own use, but not for sale and distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, what came up when Judge Butler uh, dismissed the case against Philip Morris for the heat sticks, it it highlighted, and he also, this was another point that he, he raised, was uh, he when he cited the act and that it was about tobacco products. Anyway, what he highlighted was oral tobacco products mm -hmm intended yeah. for chewing were yeah. banned. Well, you don't chew snus. You don't chew oral nicotine pouches. No, and so it actually also highlighted that the Smoke Free Environments Act 1990 actually did not ban the import of Swedish snus or oral nicotine pouches. Um, and so some people were by then distributing oral nicotine pouches and were willing to, you know, test that in uh, that case in law. So the Vaping Regulation Act has a number of things in it. It's a lot more than just regulating vaping. Mm 
Another clause in this new act uh, that they slipped in there was a um, that the act gives um, it, it gives power to it, it obligates New Zealand that New Zealand is obligated to implement the framework convention on tobacco control. Now that was never in the law before, but the 1990 law preceded the development of the framework. So Ashley made sure that it was put into the Vaping Regulation Act that only just passed last year. So yeah. this letter he wrote, um, I, I believe was not legal at the time for him to do this, and I had legal grounds to fight it. Uh, and then they changed the law. That's what they'll do to you. If you, you know, if they're on shaky ground, if they, if they don't have a very strong legal basis for excluding your voice, for doing everything that they are doing to you, um, mm -hmm. then they will just change the law. So you have to be aware of and look at every, every amendment to mm -hmm. smoke free or tobacco laws that they may be pushing through. There are always clauses and, and other little bits that are slipped in there. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, we went through it. I'm sure you're aware of what happened with the with the new regulations. It basically it killed Avka because we couldn't do all the things that we wanted to do that we were doing that we were successful at doing because we weren't government funded and we weren't following their plan. And you know, trying to explain to them that you know we work, what we do works. Um, why would we do what you do, which doesn't work, but they didn't want to hear it. So Exactly. So, yeah. you know, there were challenges to New Zealand's uh, freedom of speech laws or, you know, laws that protect freedom of speech in the draft amendment. So that was one of the things that uh, they, there was even a clause in there. Not only was it about shutting down consumers and, and consumer advocacy groups and, you know, basically you know, prohibiting you from speaking, from taking away your right to freedom of speech um, and to talk publicly about vaping, mm -hmm. you know, to help others switch to vaping. Mm -hmm. They also had, it, it could have extended to researchers. Well, that's mm -hmm. a suppression of science. This letter is suppressing science. I'm a scientist, I do research. None of the people who work in health in New Zealand are allowed to read my research. They're not allowed to even read it. The district health boards block my website. If a staff member tries to visit my website, my centre website, they can't. It doesn't exist for them. They would have to do it from their home computer. And they're not. Some of them are not that IT savvy. Um, so. They, they do not get to hear about my research. If anyone accidentally, because they don't know, uh, does ask for my advice or contact me, um, if anyone, others at work find out, they'll be told they're not to have anything to do with me. So as the leading expert on reducing indigenous smoking in the world, um, the, there is nobody else that can provide the level of advice and expertise that I can, that he is saying they can get from elsewhere is simply not true. Um, and it's also that controlling the narrative, controlling what's allowed to be said. Uh, and we are, there are many challenges uh, looking to remove freedom of speech in New Zealand at the moment, apart from just tobacco control. But this is just one act where it was slipped in and I totally agree with you, what they did was wrong. Um, vapors in New Zealand have helped more people switch from smoking, quit smoking, than all of the cessation workers working for, you know, in any funded, government funded agency, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, it, it, it's it's interesting to me because, you know, I sit there and I look at things sometimes and I'm like, you know, the things that they accuse all of us of doing are the exact same things that they're doing. And that university who shall remain unnamed and you know who I'm talking about, you know, we were welcomed with open arms. And then once the new regulations came through, they threw 5.3 at us. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute. Without any, you know, without actually having a discussion about it. It was just like, nope, sorry. And I'm like. I'll give you my financials, you know, whatever. They mm. don't 
want to know. And that's yeah. really sad because that does go against the true intent of harm reduction and what the FCTC stands for. Well, the suppression of science is is really uh, rife, not just in tobacco control, but particularly in tobacco control. So um, any researchers working in academia or who do go into those like health research councils, government funded um, f funding pots, of money uh, have all been told they mustn't they can't go to the global forum on nicotine um, the society for research on nicotine and tobacco which is a professional association of researchers around the world who do research on tobacco and nicotine and i was a member for many 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 years and worked on committees and, and i was associate editor for their journal for years years and years um, and now they have just passed the American, the main body of of that society. Tobacco company researchers are no longer allowed to present at uh, those science. It's supposed to be science-based, evidence-based conferences. So it really, the echo chamber is shrinking and shrinking um, and they only sort of listen to each other and cite each other um, and they they c are collaborating and colluding on creating a lot of research that just says the same thing regardless of the fact that it isn't true. Yeah, well, I found it interesting. Um, earlier, we, were, we had Shri on for the panel and of course she's explaining the situation in India which I'm sure you know about. And yeah. of course, being a female researcher, you understand about that as well. Um, and, we, you know, as we were talking, the report came in, you know, on the FCA, you know, they do their daily report. And it was really quite interesting because basically they were chastising everyone that was there for not agreeing and not following the plan and not doing as they were told. And we were discussing that. And I said to myself, you know, this is interesting that people are now starting to kind of buck back. So I think if we give it some time, it's going to take a while. Hopefully you and I will see it. There will be changes. I think it's mm. coming, Madawa. I just don't think it's going to happen overnight. Um, 30 years, um, all that's happening is that it's getting, it is getting worse. And um, there's a science fiction um, program on Amazon Prime, I think, called The Foundation. <laughs> and it's, it's science fiction. It's in the future. And there's a, a scientist who is it's kind of like maybe it has a natural course to run. The pendulum yeah. has to swing so far mm -hmm. that if people have any, um, even a tiny wee little bone of goodness in their body, then they, they might wake up, you know. I mean, this is basically bullying. It's McCarthyism. It's... Yeah. Um, it's yes. ostracism, you know, I won't, I won't call it apartheid because that's far more serious, you know, uh, mm -hmm. specific structural thing that occurs. This is, this is bullying, mobbing, all of those terms. And mm -hmm. we'll be having a panel on it at the Global Forum on Nicotine next year. Uh, what can we do? You know, how far, I, honestly, they, I haven't had any death threats. You know, but Moira Gilchrist from Philip Morris has. Yeah. Um, these people have lost the, their principles. They have no yeah. ethics. You yeah. can't hope that they will recover. I mean, there, there have been some, there have been a few who have like, okay, okay, the evidence, you know, I, I can see it with my own eyes. People are switching uh, much faster from than any other cessation method, and vaping is not even a cessation method. But if people use it that way, they can see the if, the evidence. They can see it's working. Uh, people, scientists with some ethics and quality scientists, um, if letting the evidence show them, and then they're starting to speak out. Um, yeah. And, you, you know, minutes. history will show we were on the right side of history, yeah. but I don't think it'll happen. I don't think I'm going to see it. I'm sorry. I don't think I'm going to see it. I don't know. I kind of hope we will. Um, it takes a about, long time. I know. We've got a minute. So is there anything last? You have to revolt. You we need a revolution. 
<laughs> you have to do what Gossi Lelab was say, saying in South Africa. You go take it to the streets, you know, um, you have to be louder. I know how hard that is for you. I know how hard it is. Um, but, you know, wow. just be like that doll, the Bilbo doll or whatever it is. You know, you yeah. get hit down, just bounce back up. That's what I do. You just bounce back up, keep on yeah. with the work and, and stay connected with each other. History Thank is you. you are doing the right thing. Thank you, Marwa. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thanks, evening. Thanks, guys.